I wanted to welcome uh, the penman, Tom Bailey. How are you doing today, Tom? Oh, bright and shiny. It's still vertical. That's really good, you know. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm glad to hear you got some uh, sunshine down there. We don't up here. Um, before we get going too much into the interview, what uh, let us let us know where you're located. Tell the people that uh, are watching where you're actually located, Tom. We have two locations. Uh, I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You can see the beautiful woods out behind me. Yeah. And my partner Hong, uh, who just muted her video, is located in Ann Arbor. So. Okay. Together. Uh, yeah, most people when they see you at the show that Hong is with you. So I, I'm sure the people that are here know that. But um, some people that maybe don't uh, wanted you to explain that. Great. Uh, hey, what kind of brands do you uh, sell, Tom? Tell us a little bit about that. I know you've got a specialty, and we'll talk about that here shortly. But what are the other brands that you sell so, or represent? Uh, we have a dealer for four lines of pens, and most of our business is Pelican. Uh, right. He adopted the uh, platinum pens also. They seem to fill in a price range that uh, Elkin has doesn't have that much there, and their quality. And we uh, also added noodlers from day one because uh, very, very inexpensive uh, pens that easily maintainable by yourself, you know. And the 400-plus mm -hmm. colors of ink don't hurt either. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, most recently we added Tasha to the line also. We're just getting started in that. Okay. We do. Well, great. Our business is probably, it varies um, maybe to a peak of 50% vintage. Okay. Down right now, our vintage stock is extremely low. Uh, so maybe only 10 to 15%. But and those are all brands, although most of them are Pelicans also. Sure. So I know your specialty brand is, is Pelican, uh, and probably most people watching know that. Uh, do you have anything in particular that you want to talk about? Uh, anything new with its Pelican, Scott, uh, that well, uh, you uh, want to bring up? Or? A little background, I guess, how we uh, grew up. I bought my first fountain pen, I'm almost ashamed to say it in public, in 1966. And okay. See, that's the, that's the year I was born, Tom. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> well, you weathered well. Oh, thank you. No hair, but... Yeah. That was, a, believe it or not, a Bic fountain pen. Okay. They were in the promotional market, and I was in the college bookstore, and there was a white uh, cartridge pen with uh, the the, uh, the name of the college on the side in, in dark purple. And that's where I started off. And actually, the bookstore manager told me they weren't going to carry that line anymore, so... I bought all nine that he had left. They're a whole three dollars and seventy five cents each. Right. I still have seven of them in the celluloid wrapper. Wow. So oh, that's really cool. Turning yellow. Then I bought my first real fountain pen. Um and I think it was nineteen seventy two. I was at a business meeting and somebody else had a uh the classic flagship pen, the M eight hundred green stripe. Okay. And I said, I really like that. That's a lot. So next week she took me to the pen shop and uh, showed me which one it was and off and running my first Pelican. Well, all right. So all right. the hobby grew until about six years ago, and I found that I was out of storage. And like many collectors who start out, uh, it was sort of like that line from uh, Edgar Allan Poe's the, the Raven. Ooh, smart mm -hmm. thing. Take it home. You know? <laughs> I had no... Uh, I didn't care much about what it was, but I had um, demonstrators and pelicans for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we started to trim and found, uh, so we started to catalog them, lots of duplicates I didn't even know about. So mm -hmm. yeah. about six years ago, I decided, well, let's sell these off, and I took my first table. And uh, about two or three shows later, I met Hong. And uh, the two of us decided to do it uh, as a partnership. And our first one was uh, five years ago in, in Ohio. Uh, well, that's really cool. I know you and Hong have been around together for a little while. So right. you've become an icon uh, at the uh, pen shows. Yeah, so. she's beauty and I'm the beast. <laughs> 
Uh, Tom, I know that you've got uh, your, your pen lines between all of them. They're, they vary in price and from uh, entry level pens, you know, five, ten dollars all the way up to the ultra high end. Uh, you told me the other day, 20,000 at some point. It's actually for a pair, but yeah, it's $20,000. They call it the okay. health. But I, I threw together a couple of pictures. So I'm going to try this uh, share and see what happens so everybody can see it better. And. That's interesting. Not having done this, it looked so easy when Ken did it the other uh, meeting I was in. Uh, well, do you have any, can, can you kind of explain to us what your entry level pens are? Are they really like the preppies and stuff? Yeah. Okay. I can hold up first this photograph. Anybody see that? Not yeah, I, detail if I were sharing full screen, I'm afraid. Yeah. But that, that is a preppy underneath and a prefonte laying on top of it. And in fact, that is one of the pens I carry, the prefonte. Okay. Uh, those are essentially the same pen. The preppy is $5 uh, retail and the prefonte is $10. And I would probably stand by the statement that the preppy dollar for dollar is the best and most pen you could possibly buy. For uh, five bucks, you're saying? Yeah. I mean, I've been yeah. carrying this. The only difference between the two is they've got a, they upgraded the clip to uh, metal from plastic, yeah. and there's one of the rings inside uh, has become a metal separator. But other than that, uh, they're the same pen. I mean, where else can you get uh, three or four different steel nibs and a cartridge or a cartridge converter in the barrel? Right. We laugh yeah, I got a couple of them myself. Yeah, we laugh about the preppy because the cartridge converter costs more than the pen. <laughs> yeah. so, that's the uh, the first. Okay, that looks like it's coming through. There you go. Now yeah. you now you got it. The uh, the only other difference is the preppy has a clear top, but you can see the metal um, clip on the prefontaine. And I don't know who named these, but whoever put a French name on that ten dollar pen, I don't know. <laughs> and uh screen back. This is a, a, a lineup I purveyed. The one on my right in the package is a prefontaine. I think sometimes you're paying the extra five dollars for the packaging, right? Yeah. And the pen is next to it and the preppy is in the middle with the clear cap. Then I wanted to do these are platinums. Call attention to that these are I think underestimated. These are Mottier, modern Mottier pens. These two are in black, and they have two of the, I believe there's eight designs on them. And I put up uh, Mount Fuji, which you can't really see here. Uh, one of my favorite designs, and this is the, the crane. Oh, there's Mount Fuji. You can see the big, just looks like a big uh, light spot on the bottom. Yeah. And then, then I put up uh, the... Uh, Seems like every uh, manufacturer has an entry in the uh, sparkly division, and this is their clear red demonstrator with sparkles in the, in the middle. Gotcha. So the range of these pens goes up to a retail of 240. So okay. The sparkly is one of their 3776, which is by far their most successful line. Everybody seems to like those, and that's the line that has, on some models, the ultra extra fine nib. The extra fine, the fine, medium, uh, broad, and what they call coarse, which is a double broad, mm -hmm. uh, a yeah, music nib. And, and they're not all – the music nib's not compatible with any of the others because the, the uh, nib color is different. But uh, any of – well, we do. I went to a little school, and I got a special tool to be nib extraction and swap the nibs out so we can pretty much supply any of those. The only uh, problem comes is that there's two models that have platinum-coated uh, hardware, which is silver. Mm -hmm. All the rest are gold. And the platinum-coated ones have an all-platinum-coated nib. And the okay. other is a two-tone nib. So 
We've got a quick question here. What's uh, what is the name of a makey pen? Um, sorry, the it was, what? It looks like it's uh, Mount Fuji. Hong already answered that question. It was uh, what was the name of the the makey e pen? Uh, got Mount Fuji. Uh, the uh, Mount Fuji. The Ma it's the yep. yeah, Pelican Mount Fuji. Yep. Okay. It's it's not like it's the only pen with Mount Fuji on it, but uh, in this line, these are uh, those are two hundred thirty dollars retail. Okay. Yeah. So we got some mid range pens now. You said you got some high end, some ultra high ends for a set. I didn't, I didn't bring any pictures of the high ends, but I thought this might be useful to show the Pelican okay. range. Pelican makes two standard pens throughout. One is the mm -hmm. classic. Green stripe, the black cap. The, yep. other is, uh, the other is all black. And okay. On occasion, some of those models have had um, silver hardware as opposed to gold. But currently, right. there are no silver hardware in production, so all of those would be you know, classified as vintage. Okay. But this this picture shows the the M1000, which is what I like to use. Certainly, what I have sitting on my desk. But I, I have a, actually have a complaint about the M1000. Uh, oops, the camera's in the middle and my icon's over on the side. Um, the M1000 clip, although it's a full-size clip, you notice I'm wearing a collared shirt with a pocket. Mm -hmm. Well, the M1000 clip doesn't go down quite far enough, so when I carry it, I actually always put it in a single-pen carrier and put it in my pocket. Okay. Because it's uh, that's the one flaw that I – there's nothing you can do about that, I suppose. Then we got an 800, 600, and the second from the last is the 400, and then the 300. And the 300, I can make disappear in my hand. Of course, I don't oh. have since I have like, pick up basketballs with my paws. Mm. For a more delicate hand, like my partner's, she uses the 300 regularly for uh, – some of the work that she does all the time. So, for some of the people that are watching, what are the differences in the in the uh, in those models? Is it mainly Just size? size? Okay, Just it's the size. size. Okay, yep, size only. So, when you say size, are you talking diameter or are you talking length or a combination of both? Diameter and length. Okay, so it's both then for right. each model. In fact, gotcha. the, uh, the closed length and the capped or posted length are, are different also. Okay. As I, I mentioned in one of the prior meetings, I like a very heavy pen. And yes. Frankly, for me, the M1000 could be heavier. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. There was a study done, and I wish I had that article now, that said the biggest pen you can hold, if you're going to write a lot, like several pages or more, the bigger the pen you hold, the less tired your hand will get. Really? Well, that's an interesting article. That was not weight. They were actually talking about the uh, diameter and length. So I, then I threw together a page. Oops. It's a, it's a big nib. And um, Many of the 1000s are some of their special editions, too, and often the nib will be engraved for that, like the Lighthouse of Alexandria has a beautiful sun-like engraving on it. So while all of the 1000s are, you just unscrew one and screw in a different one, you really wouldn't do it with that nib because that nib is engraved for that particular pen model. Just the engraving, though, it's different. So are we talking like a number five and a number six, or what size? Well, number up? six, please. Yeah, it's a monster. Okay. They don't, they don't number them. The 800 is their most, um, the the, uh, the highest seller, usually for men or people with bigger hands. Okay. okay? And that's the size I use. Uh, I have three or four of them laying there. The uh, 600 and the 400 are more popular with uh, people with slightly average or smaller hands. And, okay. And the 400 is, is down, that gets down to where I don't, I don't like to use it for me because I have trouble when I'm holding it, reaching up to the web between the thumb and the first mm -hmm. finger. Yeah. Okay. If it's not posted, I can't use it. Gotcha. You know, and then there's the 200, um, which 
the interchangeability, 200, 400, 600, all use the same nib. Okay. Or I, I said that wrong. You can swap them. All right. But the 600 is actually a millimeter wider. Just okay. Just the, the aesthetics of it, because the 600 is a little bit bigger pen. Uh, Looks like uh, Heather's got a question about she's got she loves the Jin Ho 149. Would you recommend an 800? Are you near any pen store where you could put one in your hand and try it? That's the question. Okay, well that would be a question then to Heather. It looks like you're talking about uh, where she coming from she the was, 149. You know, yeah, that, yep. To the but would she recommend or would you recommend the 800? So you're asking her whether she could get to a store to try, try one. It just touch one, yeah, and feel yeah. it. Um, at a pen show, I'll shake somebody's hands just to see how big your hand is. Okay. And I can tell them right away, well, you'd be better with this model or that model. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you more advice than that. I think the uh, dimensions are the same. So, okay. You know, I, I put together a, a little collage. Uh, these are all M200s. And uh, we've got, let's see, on this side over here, we got one, two, three of them that are a revival, if you will, of past barrel patterns. Okay. In, days, uh, in the early days, the barrel was really just a slip-on sleeve, uh, and they call it the binda. Uh, we don't do that today. We got rid of that. Uh, we started doing that in 1929. And I think in the 50s, stopped doing that. The barrel color and everything. And I, I don't know how well you can see it's a it's a dark smoke gray, a light smoke gray. Some people say that's a light blue. And uh, the last one in is is a blue swirly one. Okay. Then you got the should I call that a gold? The gold they call it a golden yellow. I think it's swirling just like kind of in the middle there. Yes, yeah, the white cap. Yeah. It's the same as the other three in size and, and so forth. And then, uh, well, the one in the middle has got up close rings on it. Yeah. I just, just dropped production of that last year. And you have to be careful on model numbers. That, that one, for, for no some rhyme or reason, they call the M215 instead of the 200. Okay. And it's got two others. One that, that if you ever look, uh, point your camera directly at the sun and you get those sort of uh, pinpoints that are crossed in the light. Yeah. They've got one, the barrel has all, uh, all of those, and then they've got a, a third one in the set that um, has vertical lines on it. So yeah. Okay. 215, same model on it. Out at so the edge there, yeah. Out, oh, at, go out, ahead. out at the edge, um, oh, you can't see it here I'm, unless I get really close. It's the smoky quartz. Alrighty. And I, I always get those confused. The uh, the other one that's much lighter. It's uh, not champagne, but uh, well, I always want to call it the bourbon pen. And it's a much lighter amber color. Okay. And then finally this green one, which um, I showed my 800. That's the 800 and 200 were Pelican's first limited edition. And okay. The limited edition in Pelican vernacular means that there's a number on it somewhere. That's uh, right. number 52 out of 500 or whatever. Right. And and true to not having ever done this before, Pelican forgot to put the number on the barrel. Uh. So what they did in the last second, they discovered that. Pens are all ready to go out the door. They put a certificate in each box, which gives you the numbering of that pen and the uh, a signature of the final guy to do the inspection. Okay. Well, as you can imagine, over time, boxes and certificates disappear. Sure, absolutely. So getting one with a certificate in it is a, a big plus, right? And uh, that's also a pen that later on they decided it was so successful, it sold out in a matter of days, that they said, well, we should do this again. And we didn't put a number on the first one, so let's make another 2500 <laughs> and uh, they announced that and immediately had a shareholder suit 
said, no way. You know, we've got ours. They have value. And if you flood the market, then they won't have nearly as much value. So they don't. So that's a 1994. came out the year after the M800 of the same translucent lean. Okay. Yeah. So here's a quick question for you by Lita. He's asking, uh, can a M600 nib fit into an M200? Yes, it can. Okay. It will look a tad bit large if you've got a really critical eye. And if you measure it, it'd probably be a millimeter wider at the two pointed uh, sides. Yeah. A millimeter wider than the M200. But the collar and the, the threads and everything are identical. And, in fact, I can even go further. And If you're uh, really taking the collar and the, the nib itself apart, which I don't recommend to the faint hearted because it takes a lot of – I got a pen back uh, just two weeks ago with a broken feet. I told okay. him he, he'd never done this, and that was on a platinum. He'd never done it. Yeah. Said, oh, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so, in any event, the 600 and 200 have the same base in the physical nib, too. They fit in the same collar. All Technical right. Technical detail. I threw together one more here, and this this is actually from Hong's collection, but we have these for sale. The, one on, the one on the left is the infamous pink one, and then there's the white transparent they call, the turquoise, and the violet. And does that violet, it doesn't show up all that great. Well, I can actually see the difference between the violet and the blue, so I would assume right. others can do the same or can see that. Now, they include that, um, the one that I call the uh, orange uh, orange soda in here, too, in this series of 600s. And this is where sometimes they adhere to their numbering standards. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they just make it up. Like there's a series for cities. There's 12 pens in the series, and they, they call those 640s. Okay. Mm -hmm. I don't know, because others were taken. These are called 620s and 625s. The 25 is because the white one, you, I don't know if you can distinguish that, has silver hardware on the clip. I can tell that it does, yep. All the others in this series have gold hardware. Okay. So they're 620s, and the white one's the 625. Gotcha. Usually, the 5 means there's silver involved. So an 805 would be... It's the eight, same as the 800, except the, the clip and the, the finial and so forth are silver. Okay. Well, I know that some of our viewers are wondering, do you have any specials uh, for us today? We do, and I don't have a picture. <laughs> <laughs> we have well, uh, two specials. I don't know why I didn't take that picture. Uh, the, in 2005, Pelican started to recreate their original series, and that series with a plural S on the end, from okay. 29. Yep. And uh, about the third or fourth release, there was one that was an all red uh, with a little bit of yellow mixed in on the barrel. I don't even have an example of that. I'm sorry. Um, and then they released one that's just like the M600 they just released with that red cap and red turning knob, but with the golden stripes down the body. Okay. Those two are, they both retail for about $600 in our specials, uh, 375 postage. Okay. Okay. So. And what's the going to For $400 plus postage, but ours is even under that. So what, if somebody wanted to uh, get one of those from you, Tom, what's the best way for them to place an order? Well, I'm uh, not embarrassed that the website's not ready. Our sole go-to-market has been for the last five years, the shows. Sure. And so uh, the best thing is just uh, to email either Hong or myself at the penman.net. Gotcha. And everybody fails the first time because it's .net, not .com. If anybody's got uh, any questions uh, that uh, you want to ask, if you can unmute yourself, I'm going to say go ahead and do so. 
and, and go ahead and ask. Otherwise, we've got the chat box right now. Uh, let's see. I'm going to actually unmute everybody. I'm going to attempt to do that. So you can now unmute yourself if you have a question. Corinne, whatever you did, it seems to be yeah. out of yeah. Tom, question for you. I just want to make sure I, I heard what you said a moment ago correctly, that the um, difference between the, the 600 and the 605, 800, 805, 1000, 1005, it is, there, there's no difference in the nib. It's purely the furniture, the metal trim on the pen. Is that correct? That's correct. And it includes, that includes the nib also. Uh, because most of the time you have two-tone gold nib with Pelican or the 800, for instance, and a, a uh, platinum-plated uh, all-silver nib for the 805, let's say, or the 605. Got it. Thanks. And that's good to know. And what is your sort of experience with these in terms of the difference in the writing experience between the the even hundreds and the and the 05s? Well, I was talking about <clears throat> excuse me, platinum a moment ago, and um, they are <clears throat> one full stop uh, above platinum. So if platinum says uh, medium, that's a fine in Pelican, and frankly with a lot of other uh, North American and European nibs, as probably a lot of people know. Sure, J J Japanese is one typically one or two not notches different. But yeah. What about the difference within Pelican between the – uh, 800 in the 805, say, just in terms of blindfolded so uh, same, uh, just, on the paper. Well, between 800 and 805, no difference. It's the same material on the nib that's touching the paper. Got it. So Thank it's, you. Uh, I Great. So the, go ahead. They have explained to me how they do a two-tone nib, and then, you know, I have a science and technology degree. I got a couple of them, actually, and I'm still not sure of the chemistry behind it, but they basically, it's a single tone solid gold nib, and then they mask off the part they want to remain gold, and they, um, I don't, again, I don't know the right term. They don't spray paint it, but they, electrolysis or something, the platinum onto the open parts of the nib. Yeah, it's a I chemical think, thing. Yeah, if I remember from the factory, it's like a foil they put on and they somehow chemically or electrically fuse fuse it on. It's uh and enjoy, it's, it's they, enjoy to watch. They a big point with me that it's sufficient to chemically bond the surfaces so they become one. Correct. Yep, correct. Exactly. It'll flake off. Although they did not do that on earlier pens that were uh, pre-1960. That were simply gold-plated steel nibs. That that gold plate will uh, wear off. Actually, I've never seen one flake off in big pieces, but it's hard if it doesn't wear off. So I guess it was too thin. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, Tom, if, since you have experience with both the platinum lines and, of course, the long experience with the Pelican lines, um, how, how would you compare the two? I mean, obviously the Japanese nib sizing is different from the from the European, but you know, I, I tend to view both of them as being highly reliable. The darn things are gonna work out of the box and they'll give you years of service. There's not a lot of uh quality control issues with either. But for someone say just, just getting into that level of pen, how, how would you compare those two well, manufacturers? Well um one of the uh one of the things I didn't throw up here, Platinum has some pens that go right up into the thousands, like $1,500, $1,000, uh, fully um, competitive with Nakayas, or as most Americans say, Nakayas. Um, every bit is good, and in fact, in a couple of cases, use the same artist to do them. They are absolutely gorgeous. We don't inventory them. They're very expensive. Uh, but I haven't found a platinum pen that never had a problem. Pelican pens, I have found a problem out of the box once in a while. Uh, the tines are not perfectly aligned. And by that, I mean I take it, my two thumbs, 
I press just a little bit and there's a spring or a little a bit of give back. Uh, and I press just a little bit and look at it in a loop until they're perfectly lined. But that's like one in a hundred. And that's all they really need to um, uh, be perfect. So they do tend, the Pelican, I think, is one of the wettest pens sold. I should say the Pelican nib of, of any brand. And certainly wetter than the Platinum tends to be a tad bit drier. Which, of course, that can be adjusted on both pens. If you want your Pelican to be drier, you can adjust that. If you want it to be wetter, uh, you can adjust that, too. One of my handiest tools is a sheet of... Uh, okay, I'm going to have to jump in here for a second, guys. Uh, we've got a, a couple more minutes here yet. And so if there's anybody else that wants to uh, ask a question, let's go ahead and do that. We've got our, our next spotlight here it's going to be starting in about 10 minutes 15 minutes so is there anybody else that's got any more questions uh that might want to ask somebody asked Holly yeah. a question she's extremely knowledgeable also <laughs> and i'm not trying to be rude we're just trying to stay on schedule here right. just to let everybody know so um is there, if there's anybody else that has any more questions, go ahead and ask them now. Yeah, I'm just curious if adjusting the wetness of a nib is something you would uh, recommend uh, a user to do, or would you send it in? Um, that's a partial yes and partial no. I mean, there are some very, very simple things you can do if you've got a loop. You can look at it head on, so like you're going to poke yourself in the eye and see if it is misaligned. Now, it, now it's your choice. Do you feel confident of putting two thumbs, one on either side, on either time? You can do a little bit, although I got a broken one back from somebody one time. Okay. That must have been extreme. I, I've never seen a Pelican nib break except when they dropped it on the concrete from a moving car, um, or any nib for that matter. Or it may be just if you have a piece of the brass flossing stuff. But I, I bought a roll, like a roll of paper towels. It's not really that long. But it's a .005. Mm -hmm. You can floss between the tines. And that will often uh, clean it up. Or ultrasound will also. Ultrasound's your friend. Remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, beyond you. that, then I hope it's done. Buy a five dollar preppy and practice on it. That's good advice. That's a good idea. We got a question here real quick. Um Tom or Hong. It says, What sizes are the burnt orange color combinations available? Uh just M eight hundred or others? Oh no, just the M six hundred that goes in line with the uh, the four I showed. That uh, and it's called a cream sickle is what it is. Both Okay. There was an M eight hundred with a black cap and a solid orange barrel. But that's uh, that was three or four years ago now. Tom, um, I think Lita asked about the the burnt orange. So it's the M800. Yeah, Maybe that's the one that was two or three years ago, a uh, special edition, the black cap and the solid orange barrel. And I, I remember we sold our last one to another dealer at the Arkansas show a couple years back. I haven't seen the other side, Lita. <laughs> so, yeah, they're hard to come by. But there, I, there's a couple of used ones I saw on eBay. Tom, I want to say thank you. I apologize for the difficulties that you're having there. We no, did it. Really that with Glenn's help, we got it done. Yeah, we moved some things over, but we uh, apologize for that. Um, I thank you again, uh, and thank you to everybody that has uh, tuned in with us. Um, uh, one other thing I would mention, if you want to get on our email list, we put out one issue in the last four years. Uh, please send me your email address, and I'll add you to that list for the next uh, issue. Great, great. Okay, well, I thank everybody.